Okay, so you probably know what a paradox is. You've heard of that, you know what a paradox is? Well, I looked it up online to talk about, uh, to see what Webster's had to say about it, and it's a paradox is really a seemingly self-contradictory idea or statement that when investigated or explained, it may prove to be true. Like, for example, you may have heard the uh, example of somebody saying that the biggest failures I've ever had were successes. Now, it sounds like that's opposite. How can that be? A failure can be a success, but if you start talking about it and looking at it, you can see how that sometimes when we go through failures, it sets us up for a later success. Or by, uh, you've also maybe heard that good way to save money is by spending it, and that sounds like a contradiction, contradiction too, but sometimes you know that maybe you have to spend a little money in order to really get to where you save, like if you were buying uh, budgeting software or something. You gotta spend a little bit of money in order to save it. So the Christian life is full of paradoxes, full of things that look like contradictions on the surface, but when you dig down in them a little bit, you uh, you find out that they are really truth there. And we looked at, so far, two of them, and there's more, but two of them in Mark so far. In chapter 8, we saw that Jesus said whoever saves his life is going to lose it, but whoever loses his life for his sake, and, uh, loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. And so it looks like a paradox, right? How can you save your life and lose it or lose it your life and then save it? And what it, Jesus is really talking about losing our lives, our self-focus in the temporal realm, in the uh, world now, and having, but that has the opposite effect in eternity. Or in Mark 10, we talked about whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And we talked about this just this semester and that you know, great people aren't the ones who serve in this world, right? They're the ones who have people serve them. That's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. Serving others and serving God really elevates you far more than demanding others serve you. So you see the paradox there. So paradoxes help us see deeper truths when we start digging in them uh, to, rather than what's just on the surface. And so as I study Mark 15 and this very familiar story of the crucifixion and the death and resurrection of Christ, I realize that this chapter is saturated with paradoxes. And they help us see when we get below the surface of what's just uh, happening there, we start seeing the real understanding of the crucifixion from God's perspective, not just what's happening on the surface, but what is happening underneath. So let's look at this chapter with that in mind. And so remember where we are, if you've been with us all along, last time we examined the first part of uh, chapter 15, where we met two men, right? We met Pontius Pilate, and we learned that he not only just said one time that Jesus was innocent, he said, declared three times Jesus was innocent, and he kept passing the buck to everybody to try to get somebody to handle this Jesus problem here, and he ends up giving the people of choice where we met the other guy, Barabbas, and um, so what we saw last time is how that fulfilled the prophecy from the old way to the Old Testament perfectly. And then Barabbas is ultimately released and Jesus condemned. So in Mark chapter 16, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 20, he tells us about the soldiers who beat him and mocked him and before leading him out to be crucified. And that was prophesied in Psalm 22 that we'll cover in more detail in just a minute. But we're going to pick up today in verse 21 to see the first paradox of the cross. That is, what seems to be weakness is really <laughs> hidden strength. And so we see in verse 21, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. And so we got this guy, he's headed into the city as Jesus is heading out of the city. He's probably coming to do something with regards to what happened in Passover just the day before. And so he's on his way in to do something and he's pulled out of the crowd and for 
forced to carry Jesus' cross. Now, normally, the condemned in Rome were forced to carry this heavy cross piece. So, it, it's, you know, don't think two by four across your shoulders. Think more railroad tie, this big heavy piece, all the way from the prison area, from where they were flogged, to the execution site. And the point I mentioned last fall about this is that the practice was for a purpose. It was to force them into submission. Now, they could have easily left this cross piece uh, at the crucifixion site and then just brought the criminals out there. But remember, it was the, only the very, very worst criminals who are a threat to Rome and to Rome's authority who were crucified. So this would be... And uh, they did crucifixion in order to make a point. And it's like, this is what happens to people who defy the authority of Rome. So they had the crosses out there on the thoroughfare, so everybody passed by them. And so they forced these, the worst criminals, to carry this weight because they were in a weakened condition after being flogged that they, nobody could do this. It would force them to their knees. That was the point. Basically, the last thing that you're going to do here is kneel to the power of Rome. That was what they were doing there. And, but Jesus is too weak to get very far. And so they forced this guy, Simon, to carry his cross. So he looks very weak and uh, without strength here. Now, an interesting aside, just, just as a note as we're going through this. Now, Mark names this guy as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, that's very unusual because we saw last time we talked about the way that you identified somebody during this time is about who their father was. Remember we talked Simon bar Jonah? That'd be Simon, son of Jonah. So it was very unusual to identify somebody by their children. Now we have to remember that. It, that is because Mark, remember who he's writing to. He is writing to the church at Rome. These are new Christians who are Romans. And so his letter was initially sent there. So he's identifying Simon by saying, basically, this is the Simon. Y'all know Mark, uh, Alexander and Rufus, right? This is his dad. That's what he's saying here. And so interestingly enough, that the only other time the name Rufus ever appears in Scripture is at the end of the book of Romans in verse chapter 16. Paul writes, Greek Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother has been a mother to me also. So most commentators agree that this is the same Rufus here, probably the same guy that was the son of Simon here, and one can't help but wonder that Simon was forever changed by what happens here on the road to Calvary. He's going into the city, they grab him, he ends up carrying this, this cross piece out, probably stayed around to see what happened, probably just watched, and uh, the impact on him was probably overwhelming to the point that certainly made him ask some questions, certainly pr the influence here is probably what brought him to salvation because uh, Paul addresses them as clearly Christians here. And so his influence, this influence of this moment here went on to impact his wife, his children, and as an aside, that would be us too, right? I mean, we ought to be so impacted by what we know and have experienced with Christ, seeing what he's done, that it just naturally overflows on everybody else that we know. Right? So this transformation in him ends up impacting him and certainly people through her, uh, through his wife, Paul himself, and everybody in the Roman church. So back to Mark 15, go back to verse 22, go on in the story. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. So the word here can mean, uh, brought can mean carried. It can also mean led, so whether they're actually carrying Jesus in his complete weakened condition or they just ushered him along with the soldiers, uh, this is a, a picture of extreme weakness and dependency in Jesus right here in this moment. But the paradox here is, of course, Jesus is not weak. Jesus is all-powerful. See what, uh, what Hebrews 1 says? The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining what? All things by his powerful 
world, a word. And so uh, this is who Jesus is at all times. In all places, what we see in the picture in Mark 15 and the end of the other Gospels is not a loss of power. It's not being subjugated. It's a demonstration of willing submission. His life is not taken from him. And we'll go into this more next time in kind of part two of this. But John 10, 18 says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Willing submission, not weakness or loss of power. And go on to verse 23, Mark 15. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So that uh, this wine that was mixed with myrrh uh, was an anesthetic drink. It was supposed to dull the pain of people who were being crucified because it was excruciating. And so the words there, they gave him, they offered him, means they did it over and over and over again to try to help him relieve some of this pain. But Jesus refused, and he could have at least alleviated a little bit of the pain, but he chose to endure it with full mental, uh, his full mental ability. So shame, so, I mean, so uh, weakness is really not weakness in this moment, but power. And the next paradox, we move on. Shame is really concealed glory. Verse 24, and they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. So, first of all, this is fulfillment of uh, the Messianic Psalm, uh, verse 18 of Psalm 22. We'll come back to this again in a minute. So, it's, it's exactly what David prophesied hundreds of years before. And I hope when you, if you got the emails and did some work before this, that you took some time to compare Psalm 22 with what you see in the Gospels, but uh, <laughs> say, David vividly and accurately uh, describes exactly what's happening at crucifixion, even though crucifixion never even existed until all the way up to the Roman time. Mm -hmm. So he's describing something that it, it, it's not like he's going, oh, this is what it could be like. It's never happened before. And so about shame, under Roman law, when they crucified people, remember it was making an example of them. <laughs> You don't want this to happen to you. Don't defy Rome because if you do, this is what's going to happen was kind of what they did with crucifixion. And so the most shameful and humiliating thing that could happen to a Jewish man would be to be caught naked. Now, for modesty's sake, most of the paintings of, of Christ from the Renaissance era have a nice little drape, drape cloth over him, but that's not the way it was. He was crucified uh, almost 100% completely naked. So... The soldiers took every last bit of dignity that he had in this moment. They took his clothing, and think of the shame and humiliation that this must be for him to be there on the cross, just, just from a surface viewpoint now. We're up on the top. That's what it looks like, right? He seems to be humiliated and mocked and jeered, but through his work in the moment, what's happening at this moment in Mark 15 what does Philippians chapter 2 tell us? But that one day, because of this, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so this is a moment, actually, it looks like shame, but it's actually um, exaltation. And if we look in uh, the whole of, of Revelation 5, just the end of it here, it says, John tells us that, he heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, the crucified lamb, by the way, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever. This is not shame. This is a moment of exaltation and a moment of immense glory. And then we go on to the third paradox of the cross is that mockery is actually a testimony of truth. And this is a whole little section here that we'll go through verse by verse. But this shows how Jesus is, again, mocked and ridiculed over and over and over again. Verse 25 and 26, it was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. So Pilate first placed this placard over his head there, and it was intended to belittle him. And not only belittle Jesus, but belittle the entire Jewish nation. Basically saying, here's your king. 
Look at him in all his glory. Look what Rome has done to your Messiah, your king. We have beaten him and bloodied him. And he's gasping for every breath right here. It was intended to be sarcastic and degrading, but actually was a testimony of truth, right? Because what does the revelation tell us about Jesus? That he is indeed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This whole passage, if you start at the beginning of 19 and read it, it reveals who God is, who Christ is in all his glory and all his strength. And so this is not, uh, that testimony of Pilate is the actual truth. He is the king of the Jews and king over all things. And then verse 27, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. This is also meant to be derogatory. He's just another common criminal out here with all the rest of them. Nothing special here. He's guilty just like the rest of them. And that would be the idea. But instead, the paradox here that we're seeing here is there's none more innocent than him. No one who lived was more innocent than Jesus was. First John 3, 5 says, you know he appeared so he might take away our sin, but in him is also no sin. Hebrews 7, 26, such a high priest meets our needs, and there's all of these adjectives here. Jesus is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, and exalted above all the nations. So dying here with those who couldn't save themselves is the point, right? I mean, we can't save ourselves. He was dying to be made like us. They were pinned there by their own, own, own sin just as surely as we were, as surely as we are before we know him. And the, the thief who was there cried out, you know, he's like, you know, to save me, can, save me, he says. But realistically, it makes no sense if you're pinned there in crucifixion to call out to another another person pinned there, what's he going to do for you? I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. But that's the paradox. It's in his death that released us all from the grip of death and gives us eternal life. That's what uh, John 10 says. 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But what does he come to give? But life. Life to the full, life abundantly is what some translation says. That's what is happening here at this moment. Not death, but bringing the life. And we got more mockery coming up in 29 and 30. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. It's amazing that this hostile crowd, right, they forgot everything else about Jesus except this one thing. They forgot about the miracles, they forgot about resurrection from the dead, and that they were healing all their friends, and these wonderful, the, the Beatitudes, and the Sermon on the Mount, and these awesome parables, and how he was calling out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Uh, and they seized on the one thing that they thought was blasphemous, and they didn't even get that right, <laughs> because... He never said he would destroy the temple. That's not what he said. What he said in John 2 is destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He doesn't say I'm going to destroy the temple. What he says here is he's not referring to what he's going to do to the structure that's behind him. But he's saying he's referring to what they are about to do to his body and prophesy his resurrection after three days. Here's the thing, the mocking mob, without knowing it, what they did was spoke truth. Is that on the follow out of three days later, God raised up the temple of his body that they had destroyed on the cross, or tried to destroy on the cross. Their false testimony is really a true testimony, even a prophecy of Jesus' resurrection. Keep going with the mocking, in the same way the chief priests and all the teachers they mocked him and said, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him heaped insults on him. And this is the greatest paradox of this little section right here, is that the crowds of the chief priests and the leaders and all intended to belittle him by suggesting that he was helpless to save himself. Right? That's what they're saying here. 
Now, he certainly did have power to save himself, didn't he? Remember, Matthew says as much back in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter tries to defend Jesus. Uh, Jesus stops Peter and says, you think I cannot call on my father and he would put at my disposal more than 12 <laughs> legions of angels? Oh, I mean, that's a lot of angels, right? <laughs> I mean, but as if Jesus needed angels to rescue him, right? One word and they're all wiped out. I mean, the whole city is down, not just the guys in front of him, right? He has that power. But only before we hear about, and just a few minutes before this, we know that Jesus was struggling with God's will, his Father's will in the garden, asking, is there another way? Is there another way? But he ultimately yielded himself to the only way there was for us sinners to be saved. And here we are. He could have just called out an angel, could have rescued him, just commanded it. It would have been done. But he exercises restraint so that the greater good can be accomplished. So the mocking chief priests and all those leaders, they were eerily correct. Yes, he could have saved himself and not save us at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, last paradox of the cross is abandonment is a divine offer of grace. Now, this is the only statement that Mark tells us that Jesus uttered from the cross in his gospel. But the other gospels do say that he has six other things to say. You have a card in the back. If you didn't pick up one, take that, stick it in your Bible, and you can meditate on those. But let me just talk to you about this statement right here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this is going to require you to think a little bit. It's gonna, because I want you to follow carefully along behind me. I know it's night and everybody's been at work, but because uh, I'm going to talk about some things that are going to give a different understanding of this or a different slant on this. So traditionally, the idea here is that Jesus is crying out here to his father who has abandoned him at this moment. And that's surface look, because what else could, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, me? Except abandonment, right? That's what it sounds like. But remember, we're digging down. We're looking for the paradox underneath the obvious thing here. Now, somebody uh, confronted me with this years and years ago. And it uh, caused me to really think through this, really do some digging, really do some prayer and uh, some searching on my own. So I'm going to give you a summary of where I've landed after years of, of thinking about this. And it's going to sound maybe a little bit different if you've always been in a Baptist church. Just hold on, <laughs> because it's my hope that what I want you to do is look at the actual words of Scripture. I want you to begin to dig into this for yourself, ask yourself some questions, and wrestle with it a little bit on your own. Because, you know, we are called to be, uh, 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 to rightly divide the word of truth. We're called to examine what people say, we're to examine and match up what, what people say and how things are taught uh, to what the scripture actually says. Now, if you, at the end of this you don't agree with me, that's completely fine because there's a lot of wonderful scholars who would agree with you. <laughs> but there's also, I just want you to know that there are some other wonderful scholars, scholars out there who have a different view. So the argument goes like this, that God abandoned Jesus on the cross. This is the way the argument goes. It's based on this verse in Habakkuk 1.13. That says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. That's the New King James and, and King James Version. That's how it's translated. So the idea here is that uh, because God cannot look on evil, that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we're told that God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. And so the, 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 the thinking is that if the Father's eyes are too pure to look on evil, then he couldn't possibly look on Jesus, who at this moment in Mark 15 has taken the sin and all the evil of the whole world on him. That's how the, that's the argument there. That's the extrapolation. That's the, that's the idea where you get that Jesus has turned, I mean, God has turned his face away from Jesus on the cross. This is where it come, that comes from. So the problem with the word for look, uh, your, to look there in, is actually uh, <laughs> means to look on with approval. So the more modern translations, the NSB and a lot of others, translate this verse 
Your eyes are too pure to look approve of evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. So that's that's a whole different impact, right? So we're not talking about turning your eyes and your physical eyes and looking at something. We're talking about <laughs> giving approval to something. Now that is a 100% the truth. God never looks on sin and proves of evil ever, 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 ever. He never winks at it. He doesn't give a pass on it. doesn't say, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're like that. You're good. You're fine. Never says that. So never, 100% never does that. So if he did, that would make the sacrifice of Jesus not necessary, right? Because that's the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross is, is that God can't overlook evil. He can't pass on evil. So uh, so if he, he's, the reason he's there in Mark 15 is to repair the fractured relationship that our sin caused. That's the whole point of him being there. So God has gone to extreme lengths to make a relationship with us possible. But now think logically through this a little bit. Does the Bible give us a picture everywhere, front to back, beginning to end, of God standing away from sinners and turning his face away from them? Is that the picture we get of God in Scripture? Think about the very first story of the Bible, right? So Adam and Eve sinned. What did they do? Run away, right? They run and hide. So we don't have a picture of them standing over there in the bushes sowing fig leaves going, um, you know, we should probably go talk to God about this. That's not what happened, right? <laughs> That's right. It's God who calls them. God who says, Adam, where are you? And he comes and finds them. He pursues them in their sin. He goes after them. And he's the one that makes coverings for them. He's the one, go on in the, verse, on the scriptures, he's the one that calls Abram, Abram out of earth. Right? He calls him. He finds Moses on the backside of the desert after he's killed the Egyptian. He goes after him. He sends the spies to go get Rahab. He sends Naomi to get, get uh, Ruth in Moab. Jump to the New Testament. We just spent two, a lesson two weeks ago talking about how Jesus came after Peter and lovingly found him in his sin and restored him. New Testament on over. He's the one who finds Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road. Comes get him get on his way to murder. What's more evil than that? This is the picture we get in Scripture of God. He, the whole the Bible depicts God as the one who pursues and calls and convicts and even gives us the faith to believe. And then there's this whole, and if you want to go, wait a minute, uh, you know, I don't think God can be in the presence of evil. Now, let's go to the book of Job. What happens in the first chapter of that? Satan comes into the very throne room to have a discussion with God. So clearly, sin and evil don't cause, cause God to turn his face away. Certainly not from his son on the cross doing the work that he was sent there to do. So he never stands back and turns his arm and says, you know what? You get yourself together. Come on back over and I'll talk to you. That's not what he does. That's not who he is. He engages with us before we ever knew who he was. Now that is grace. That is mercy. That's who God is. And so some, then somebody showed me this verse, actually in Psalm 22, that we're going to look at just a little bit more before we wrap up. And it realigned my thinking about this <coughs> idea. Psalm 22, verse 24. For he, God, this is the Messianic Psalm, right? Whole things about Jesus, front, front to back. Whole things about Messiah. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has what? Not, not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his <coughs> cry for help. Oh my goodness, what does that say? God has not hidden his face from the afflicted one. That is an actual verse about Messiah written hundreds of years before this actually takes place in Mark 15. And God is present. God the Father is engaged with what's going on. And so this required me to rethink what I had been learned all my life. It's just a pivotal point of me bringing it into my line of thinking, bringing how I thought with what the scriptures actually said. Okay? 
So, but the wrestling didn't stop there. So, question was then, if Jesus cry on the cross is not God abandoning him, what is it? What is that happening there? And it's like, so I, then I really started digging into scriptures, really started un unpacking this. And the an answer that I came to was found in the context of where this statement, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me, comes from. It's, it's not something that he just said first. This is a quote from this psalm, Psalm 22, which, get, by the way, gives us a vivid, vivid picture, once again, of all of the events of what's happening at the cross. The mocking, we talked about that, and insults, shaking their head, that he's exhausted, poured out like water, band of evil men, circle me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Remember, crucifixion does not exist when David writes this. They divide my garments among them and cast lot for my clothing. So Jesus is quoting, so, so this, and the very first verse of Psalm 22 is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus is quoting from this psalm. Now, why does he do that? Why does he pick this to, to, the, to do that? So, you look over to the Matthew, stay with me now. If you look over to the Matthew version of the, the crucifixion story, in verse 43, the, 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 the leaders and the priests, and the, they, they mock Jesus by quoting Psalm 22, verse 8. You trust in God, let God rescue them now. See, almost exactly the same thing in verse 8 there. So, so they pick this verse out of this messianic psalm on purpose. He's claiming to be Messiah. That's what his followers are saying. This is the Christ. And what they're doing here is picking out this verse to jab at Jesus and, and to prove to everyone who's listening, everyone's around, that he isn't the Messiah. That's what he's doing, what they're doing here. Now, according to Matthew, the next, there's a little bit of passage of time here, that the next thing Jesus says from the cross is, my God, my God, why are you forsaken me? Next thing, next verse. So they bring, so they brought up Psalm 22 in their mockery. <clears throat> Jesus responds by bringing them back to the beginning of this whole psalm. Now, remember what psalms are, right? They're basically a hymnal, okay? There's a Hebrew hymnal. It's, it's a music book. Now, this was an oral society. They did not have papers and notebooks, and they didn't carry around a bunch of books. Nobody took a journal to synagogue. That's not the way they learned. It's not the way it went back then. So in carrying around, instead of carrying around a bunch of pit papers, what they did was they taught by memory and taught by music. And music was a huge part of their culture here. And so if you were Hebrew, you would grow up with the book of Psalms. That's what it was. You sang them at meals. You sang them at temple. You sang them when you traveled. You sang them at special events. You sang them at weddings. You sang them at funerals. You just sang these songs. You would know these if you were a Hebrew. It's just what happened. And so what I think is happening here is that by quoting the first line of this messianic psalm, the key messianic psalm of the entire book of Psalms, is what he is doing is not expressing an abandonment, but it's actually an offer of grace to the people who had orchestrated his murder. In saying this, I think it's highly probable that it was his desire that this music from this song would begin to play in their heads, like lyrics. Like say, if I said to you out right here, if peace like a river attendeth my way, what's the next line? Sorrow when like sorrows like, like sea billows roll. Next line is, whatever, whatever my life. <laughs> yes. Say. say yes. We know it. And some of you right now are seeing it around your head. And some of you are going to go all the way to the end of the song. You're going to get in your car, go home tonight, singing this song. That's the way these songs were for the Hebrews. It just flows out of you because it's so familiar. This is the same reaction that the Hebrews would have to these familiar lyrics. They see, for them, it wasn't written down. Psalms wasn't a book to read that I would just read at night. Psalms, Psalms was a book to sing, a collection of songs. God's Hot 100 or Hot 150, right? Mm -hmm. That's what these were, okay? So this gets back to my whole point about paradoxes, right? 
See, I don't see Jesus' words here as a statement of abandonment. It's much better than that. It's so wonderful. It's a demonstration of the overwhelming grace of God. What Jesus here, I think, is doing is offering a grace-filled, merciful invitation to the people to hear the words of this psalm, to take a step back, to open their eyes and see the events unfolding right in front of them. That's what's happening here, and it's as this plays in their head. They see the mockers. They see his hands pierced and, and his feet pierced, and they see it happening. Maybe that's what happened to Simon of Serene, that he heard the song in his head, and he went, wow, look, it's happening right in front of us. This whole horrific thing that's happening, he's like, he's like, I sang the first lyric for you. Now you take it and go. You see, you sing, you believe, you receive what's being offered in this moment in Mark 15. See it for what it is. And that is to the people who are standing there who are orchestrating this entire horrific scene here. Do you who want me dead? Do you mock and spit on me? Do you who try to steal my dignity, do taking my clothes? To you, every one of you in this crowd, the invitation is open. See what is happening in front of your very eyes. Step back from the brink of unbelief and see what's being offered to you. Arrive at the destination that Mark has intended since the very beginning of this letter, and that is to recognize and be assured of the identity of Jesus Christ. And then sing the song all the way to the end and end. Verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That is us. That is us. For he has done it, or in other words, it is finished. He has done it. Amen? Amen? No matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, what you, where you are standing, you are not abandoned. God has not turned his face away from you. He is with you. He offers you grace. He offers you mercy. He offers you the gift of his son. Step back from the edge of unbelief. Don't believe the lies that are in your head if you are a Christian. The offer is always grace. The offer is always mercy. The offer is restoration. Open your eyes. See. Believe. And receive. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you. Oh, an overwhelming demonstration of your love for us. How can we ever, ever get over it? Gosh, God, give us a renewed understanding of what happened in this moment. That we will not casually look, look at it and brush it off. But the overwhelming demonstration of your grace and mercy. And it's always open. No matter what we've done. No matter how far away we've been. No matter what we believe, the lies that have been handed to us, you, you offer us restoration and a new relationship with you through the sacrifice of your precious son. Lord, we pray it in his name. In the, name, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.